You know, it's funny because I teach so much on how to do deals with no money. And it's one of these things, again, that like most people, they just don't believe it can happen until they actually see it. And I didn't either. But what my mentor showed me how to do, it's actually a very simple thing, is that I put the property under contract. And in the contract, it said my company name or assignee, meaning that I can buy the property or I can assign or basically sell the contract to somebody else. And what I did was, this was a very hot area in greater Boston where people were doing what they call condo conversions, taking multifamilies, turning them into two luxury condos, which is not a thing in all markets across the US, but it's a big thing here. And so I re- Welcome to the Freedom Chasers podcast, where we bring you interviews and discussions that share the stories, successes, goals, and dreams of real estate agents and real estate investors pursuing a life of purpose and freedom. All right, guys, it's not very often that I get to interview a man that has done over a thousand flips, runs a program, gives 95% of this information he's learned along the way away for free. The only time he's charging people for his knowledge is when they want direct access to him. But he's got so many resources and so much experience that I'm so excited, Tom Caparella, to dive in with you today. And as always, if you'll start off with what is the craziest real estate transaction or experience that you've faced in your career? You know, um, I'm thinking about this for a second and it's the first deal I ever did. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why, because in 2003, I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I was pre-med in school. Everybody told me, get a good job and work as hard as you can in the corporate world or become a doctor or a lawyer. And, you know, that's the, the path to success or freedom or whatever you want to call it. After I read that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I was like, wow you don't actually have to follow kind of all of society's rules to be successful. And like your show is freedom chasers, right? I wanted to chase, I was chasing freedom, right? So in 2003, I decided I wanted to be in real estate. Six years passed for me until I did my first deal because I didn't have a mentor. I overthought everything. I, I listened to every podcast, read every book, went to every seminar and never took action. And, and finally, I got Let a mentor. Let me pause you there. Let me pause yeah. you there. Like, give us an, a backdoor seat to that thought process. Like, obviously, you're probably thinking, I just don't know enough to take action. What were some of the battles and struggles mentally you were going through in those six years? There were a few things. Um, one of them was that my circle was made up of all people that didn't believe that any of this stuff was possible. And truthfully, if I really think about it, I don't know if I thought it was possible either because I grew up, I don't want to say poor because I don't know if that's really the right terminology, but my parents never made a bunch of money. Um, I grew up in a town outside of Boston where nobody was successful that I knew. So it was like, I read a book, I went to a seminar, people that are like five you know, layers um, away from me had achieved success, but I didn't know if I could. And so I didn't necessarily know what to do. And I think the thing, you know, getting back to that first deal was like, I needed somebody when the opportunity presented itself to give me a little bit of a push. I didn't need personally a huge push. I was self-motivated, but I think if I had to boil it down to one word, I was scared. What was the tipping point or who was the tipping point for you that gave you that push? So what had happened was I joined a franchise, Homevestors, which it's the We Buy Ugly Houses, the caveman logo. Some people have heard of them, some people haven't, but they're, you know, a fix and flip um, franchise, investment franchise. And I joined them because I talked to the person in my market that was doing this. And he was only a couple years older than me. I was probably 26. He was probably 30. I related to him. He was drivable distance and he was doing this. And every time I asked him a question, he had the right answer. It wasn't some sales pitch. It wasn't some, you know, uh, far-fetched thing. And I was like, wow, like I felt the confidence that if, if I had this person kind of in my corner, I might be able to do it. So what ended up happening was I was an agent at the time. I came across this off-market deal where this seller, she was a hoarder. She didn't want to sell traditionally. She wanted an investment deal and I had no money. So I went in there, tried to list her home. She told me no multiple times. I just want to sell it. I left the appointment knowing that it was an investment opportunity, but not knowing how to do it and being a little bit scared. 
And I called my mentor. He explained to me how to wholesale the house. And I was giving him all the objections as to why I couldn't do it. And what he said to me that changed, you know, the course of, you know, my career was, if you don't want to do it, I'm going to. And so it was kind of a funny statement. He didn't really mean like he was going to steal the deal from me, but basically like, this is such a good opportunity that if you don't want it, I'll just pay you a fee to take it over if you really want to. And I'm like, no, 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 hold on. No, I can do this. <laughs> and he walked me through it. And we end, and the reason why it was crazy was not just because it was my first deal, but I made $115,000 wholesaling the deal without even having to put up any money on my own, do any repairs or any construction. And that one deal like changed everything, not only because I got the money, but also the mindset shift, like, wow, I did this. And it's like anything else. You ride a bike for the first, you, 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 you get on a bike, you can't ride it. You don't think you can. Then you ride it. You can't go backwards. Like, you're not going to not know how to ride a bike again. You have the muscle memory. Well, and I mean, it's, it's hard not to get a little bit inspired when you made 115 grand. Yeah. And money seems to be a big hang up for most people, especially agents, because they're traditionally watching all these transactions happen. And all of them need, you know, a loan. And, and so there is, everything is centered around the money, but you just express you didn't need money. And so mm -hmm. can you walk us through that process? Like, how did that actually transact? And I know you said wholesale, but if you could break it down for someone who's never done a real estate deal, how did you make 115K with no money? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's funny because I teach so much on how to do deals with no money. And it's one of these things, again, that like most people, they just don't believe it can happen until they actually see it. And I didn't either. But what my mentor showed me how to do, it's actually a very simple thing is that I put the property under contract. And in the contract, it said my company name or assignee, meaning that I can buy the property or I can assign or basically sell the contract to somebody else. And what I did was, this was a very hot area in greater Boston where people were doing what they call condo conversions, taking multifamilies, turning them into two luxury condos, which is not a thing in all markets across the US, but it's a big thing here. And so I reached out to a few contractors and, and developers that I knew every single one of them wanted it. It was just a matter of how much they were going to pay me. And so what I said to all of them, I said, I have, you know, serious interest in this property from multiple people. Just give me your highest and best offer. And, you know, I'm going to take the highest and best offer. I did that. Um, and again, it ended up coming out to $115,000. So what ended up happening was, I signed another contract between me and the, the, the developer paying me $115,000 to take over my contract. And when the closing happened, I got $115,000 and they actually were the ones who bought the property from the seller. Yeah. And experienced wholesalers know that when you sign your contract rights to another end buyer, generally that amount, that 115,000 in this case, goes to a title company and it gets shown to a seller. Yep. And sometimes when they see that big of number, they're like, oh my gosh, you're making $115,000 on this deal. They panic. So in yep. that deal, did the seller just not panic? Or did you have to kind of coach the seller through like why it's okay that you're getting paid 115,000 bucks? Well, in, in that case, the only person who saw the assignment contract was me and the developer. It wasn't the seller. Having said that, this seller was of the mindset, and, and this is a part of the story I guess I didn't tell yet, is that I went out there to list the property. And I knew that this property was worth $400,000 or close to it. And she kept saying to me, I need $300,000 to get to my next place. That's what I need. That's what I want. I want to sell it, but I don't want anybody in the home. That was like her big thing. And the reason was because she was a hoarder. And what I think a lot of people don't understand because they haven't experienced it is that although money is very important to 95% of people, for 5% of people, it's not the most important thing. Her biggest fear, which again, like for me, I don't understand it, but this was her concern. I've lived here my whole life. I don't want my neighbors to know I'm a hoarder. That was her thing. Like that was her thing. She wanted to leave, I guess, you know, you might want to say like with dignity, I guess, even though like to me, I don't understand that. But to her, that was her top priority. So what a lot of 
um, aging, some people don't understand, and they they get kind of mixed up is like, just because you want something or it's important to you doesn't mean it's important to somebody else. So you have to listen to what's important to somebody else. It's like a simple thing, right? Like I'm wearing a t-shirt, I have sneakers on. Some people say to me like, hey, you should dress better. You should buy more expensive clothes. You can afford more expensive clothes, but it's not who I am, right? So like to me, like, you know, dressing like 10 out of 10, like it's not the most important thing to me. So it might be important to you. So everybody's different, right? They, there's a reason why there's many different like types of products. There's fast food, there's high end, there's everything. So that's what makes America great is that no matter what you want, you can get the need served. But the reason people don't understand it is because only 5% of people will say, yeah, I know I can get more money, but I want X, Y, and Z. And the X, Y, and Z is what we solve as investors. There can be a lot of different things. I, not to, to tell too many stories, but I had another person who um, they, we, we, we went out to their house. They, they, they did not have a job. They hadn't worked for a long time. They lived in their parents' house. Their parents passed away and they needed, they wanted to rent. They didn't want to keep up with the house anymore. They went around, they couldn't find anybody to rent a, the house to them because they had no job, no income. So what we had to do as investors, we came in, we paid two years of their rent to the, the landlord that they were going to go to so that they could get this rental property. And in exchange, we got the property for a little bit of a discount. So the thing to, to keep in mind is that as investors and, and as agent investors, we're always solving a problem that a traditional deal can't solve. I love this. And then what you're mentioning is a form of creative financing, which I would love, love, love to go down with you. I want to come back to your point about the 115,000. Yep. There's multiple ways you can look at this. You can look at it from the sales aspect, which I think you articulated so well, which is essentially make sure you're not just assuming somebody has certain values and give them what they want. And a lot of times that can make huge discounts for you on the purchase. But the second thing is just for people that are battling their own demons, this woman's demons cost her 115 grand. She was willing to pay 115 grand to not to let five people in her neighborhood not know that she's a hoarder. So, I mean, that's just crazy to think about. It is. Let's dive into both the creative financing element, but I want to address it from the vantage point of agents going into investing because we both have this shared passion of being an agent's great, but it's a job. Like it's a yep. grind. Being an investor is what sets you free. So kind of talk to us about investing and that journey from agency to, to freedom. Well, it's interesting because I have a brokerage. I have over 350 people in my brokerage. And I, t I always ask people like, why did you get into real estate sales to begin with? Almost every person, like the first thing that they think about is freedom and flexibility. And it's kind of ironic because they get into a field where there's very limited freedom and flexibility. And yes, on a day-to-day, -day, a lot of times you do have some freedom and flexibility, probably more than a job. But at the same time, if your client wants to see a house on Saturday at nine o'clock in the morning and you didn't have any plans to do anything, you, you're jumping, right? You're, you're giving up your nights, your weekends, and you're doing all this stuff. And real estate's awesome. Like it's fun. And that's another reason why people get into it. It's a lot more fun than having a corporate job. So um, people get into it for the freedom and the flexibility. And then what they find out is that they have limited freedom and flexibility. And investing is really the thing that provides that freedom and flexibility. And so when I say the phrase all the time, like sales will make you a living, investing will make you wealthy, I don't mean it to knock sales. I just mean that sales is active income, that you're hustling, you're grinding, and yes, you can make a lot of money doing it, but you're not setting yourself up to actually have freedom. And actually, usually the more successful of an agent you are, the less freedom you have because you're running around all the time. So the, the, the investing is the part that sets you free. And of course, like the, the best way to get there is to invest in either small multifamilies, apartments, or investing passively in other people's syndications, like syndications that we have and other people have, but also taking advantage of like fix and flips when they come across. And I know that you mentioned that we have a, a program and one of the components of that program is if somebody, if an agent finds an off-market deal, we'll do a profit share split with them um, on that flip. So one of the things that I tried to solve with agents is don't let 
that same, because I looked at that first deal I did, don't let that opportunity pass you up because you don't have money or you don't have the construction expertise. So um, I think high level, it's just a matter of understanding that passive income investing and doing some quick turns here and there is what actually going to keep stockpiling that income. And if you can pick up, you know, a property every year or every other year over the course of a 10 or a 15 year window, you're going to get to a point where you're like, wow, I don't need to work with clients. I don't want to work with anymore. I don't need to work nights and weekends anymore. And I have enough passive income. I have basically a base salary off of the, the assets that I own or invest in. And that's really what's going to set you free, not being in sales. 100%. Okay. I want to do like a thought experiment with you. So one of the things being in a podcasting position, I get to hear some of the best strategies in the world on a wide array of investing topics, et cetera. One of the things that I've only been exposed to in this last year is syndications and mm-hmm. is this idea that if you truly want passivity, you can have it. And if you pick the right, what they call jockey, you pick the right person that's running the show, you get great returns, like you, like picking the right stock in essence, but you have a lot of times the same access to the depreciations and the benefit, the tax benefits that are going on. So if someone loves sales, like loves mm-hmm. sales and is great at it, they're a great agent, they're killing it. They're making 250 K you know, in gross commission income plus they don't love investing as a mm-hmm. thing, but they, they don't want to be working their whole lives is, is syndications. Is that the right route? Like what's the route for that person as a person who is, is willing to explore investing? Like how would you advise these d- different personalities? Yeah. Um, I mean, syndication has its merits. Every investing strategy has its merits and it really comes down to like, you, you basically describe the exact person that a syndication is typically fit for. It's the person who doesn't want to spend the time, effort, and energy to get educated on investing, and they don't want to do the actual operations piece, and they want to focus on their sales, which is why, again, like, as I'm saying all this stuff, I'm not knocking sales. People can make a ton of money in sales, and if you're making a ton of money, you love sales, you're doing well, but you know you need to invest, syndication can be the right way to go. Because syndication just allows you to put your capital into a deal, allow a great operator to provide you with a return. And like the way that we do it and the way a lot of, you know, syndications do it is we pay out that money every single month. And and basically it's like owning a rental property without having any part of the actual operation, which in reality is that's really what we want. Like I, I build apartments, I manage apartments, and I'm one step removed from that, like below that. And I look at investing and real estate really as just a mechanism to improve our lives, right? I mean, I didn't grow up saying, you know, when I was 10 years old, geez, I want to own a lot of assets and collect a lot of ranks and own a lot of buildings. No, you know, we all think about this idea in our head of just improving our lives. And if you're a high income earner, a high net worth, you know, uh, individual, you're much better off and you're much passive just investing in other people's deals compared to being like me, I'm an operator and I still have to deal with the day to day. Now I'm not complaining because if I, if I go back and and the way I look at things is like every two or three years, if you're doing the right thing, you're going to make incremental life improvements based on what your business, you know, generates. So I look at like day one, I was in corporate America. I literally hated waking up every day to today, you know, whatever it is, 15 years later, being in a position where I like everything I do every day, but I still have to operate and still work hard and stuff like that. But I, I enjoy it. Right. But I do want to get to a point where, okay, I'm just using my capital to just live. And maybe I'm following even other passion projects of mine that I'm more, you know, interested in. I'd love to get to know more about you, Tom. Like, so let's start with what did you not like? And what did you like about the corporate world? And then like what, now that you're getting so much success, like what sort of freedom and passion projects are you moving into? So, um, you know, Freedom Chasers is just a great name because I think that that's really why I hated corporate world. So I was an, I was an accountant. I was an auditor at a big four um, accounting firm. So we used to go in every day to different companies and we used to audit their books. And they used to put us in a conference room that was like 10 by 10, we used to have eight people sitting at a round table doing our work. And so 
I equate it, and, and this is going to be an exaggeration, but I felt like I was in jail because you would show up at like eight o'clock and you would have to sit there until six o'clock every single day. Basically, the only time you could even move was like if you had to go to the bathroom or, you know, maybe you took a half an hour lunch break and you were just sitting in this room for 10 hours a day with eight other people not talking and just doing like computer work. And so to me, that's the exact opposite of freedom. And it's interesting because not everybody feels the way I did about that. You know, there are people that are in that room where I would ask the question being like, hey, like how bad is this? And I would get sometimes these blank stares like we work for a great company, we have great benefits. And I always say this to people who like, I think sometimes people feel like they have to be an entrepreneur or they have to start a business. And I just don't agree with that. I think if you work for a great company and you're working your way up the ladder, kind of like that high income earning agent, you can invest in these deals passively. If you like what you're doing, you've got more security. You probably are, are getting raises every single year. I think that's a really great thing. It's just for me, my feeling every day was like, oh man, like I'm, I'm trapped here. So if you kind of compare that to kind of like where I'm at today, which is, you know, I have, um, you know, 20 staff members that work for me. I have 350 agents. And what that allows me to do, you know, they call it like in, you know, I guess business world, like being in the owner's box. And being in the owner's box basically means that like, I don't have any jobs in my company. My job in my company is to make my company better. And it, it can mean a lot of different things. It can mean like I'm going on a podcast like yours and, and promoting my company. It can mean that I'm coaching somebody that works for me. It can mean that I'm uh, experimenting with something, a new system or a new tool. So for me, that's what freedom is. Like I have freedom in my business to spend my time how I want. Um, for me, that doesn't mean that I'm taking a lot of time off because I like what I do. I like growing businesses and I like, I like helping other people grow businesses. So for me, that's the freedom that I want. And um, in terms of passion projects, so I've got four kids. I have a 10-year-old daughter, a six-year-old son, a five-year-old son, and a two-year-old son. So my passion project at this point is to just, you know, help them become, you know, student athletes. And that's, that's you know, that's what I was. And that's what I think um, I'm partial to, to sports and to doing well in academics, even though I never ended up using either of those two right, things. Right. I it never became, I never got paid to play. And I certainly um, did, didn't need any advanced degrees to start my own company, but I, but I do believe in the lessons of like learning and being competitive and, you know, doing the best that you can in the life lessons that you get in sports. So my wife always kind of uh, gives me a hard time because seven days a week, I've got my kids and stuff, whether mm. it's hockey or baseball, or like they have a tutor today. And that's my passion now is just to, you know, really like i like developing people like not just like you know my agents or you know people in my company but like it extends to my kids and again it may be maybe to a point where it's not a great thing but that for me is exciting oh, how cool we have i have four kids as well yeah. and and so i i resonate deeply our kids are ages are very similar um and so let's talk about competition because i played sports growing up and loved loved it what do you see as the ways that competition helps in real estate and in the investing world? Well, so for me, um, you know, growing up, like I was never a good athlete. I never had any good tools, um, just like myself, right? Like I, I never had any like extreme kind of like gifts, you know, physically. But for me, what it taught me, and a lot of times like somebody would pass me that hadn't tried as hard as me or that, um, you know, maybe I thought shouldn't have because of the effort I was putting in. And it, it really taught me personally that like whatever you think is like good enough, you have to like do more. Like if I thought that practicing for an hour a day, if somebody else was practicing an hour a day, well, I might have to practice for two because I don't have the natural gifts. And so I, I it, it taught me like from a young age that like you have to kind of go above and beyond and you know, in this 2023 era, like life isn't fair, right? And I had so many instances myself growing up that it was like, it wasn't fair that like, I didn't get named captain of the football team because I wasn't one of the best players, even though 
I thought I had all the other characteristics. And that taught me like a lesson that, again, it's like whatever you think that you need to put in, you have to double it. And, and um, since I took on that mindset, like I can, I can really remember being in high school. I remember when I didn't get named captain of the football team, I literally, I left the banquet and I was crying. And I, I look back on that moment, just real, just realizing again that like, things aren't fair and you need to put in the effort to make them like unfair in your direction. And I made sure because I had a, I had a bad senior year. I broke my hand twice and I made sure I was like, I'm not going out this way. So I ended up playing in college and I, I probably shouldn't have ever, you know, been on the team <laughs> because I wasn't good enough. But I remember that summer and I remember telling all my friends, I'm like, I'm off limits for the summer. Like I'm, I'm training, I'm not going out, like I am making this freaking team and I'm going to play some sort of role on that team. And that was another thing, you know, that sports taught me because I think like everybody wants to be like the superstar, right? Like everybody. And it, it taught me another lesson of like becoming a role player in any way that you can. And I, I realized that like, I know this is getting to be like, you know, talking about a young age, but at like 16 or 17 or 18, like I was too much of like a me person. Like if I wasn't going to be the captain, if I wasn't going to be the running back, like I didn't want to play a different position that wasn't as glamorous. And, and what it, what it really taught me is like, there are roles for everybody and you have to do them to the best of your ability. And then your time is going to kind of come. And, and so I would have never gotten those lessons in academics. I wouldn't have, because for myself, like I was always very good academically. I was like the opposite of sports where everybody told me always how smart I was. So for me, I needed sports to be like, oh wow, like you actually aren't as good as you think you are and you need to double down on your efforts. Once I made that determination, once I, I realized that, that I need to double down, then everything became easier because instead of me putting in the same effort as somebody else, I'm putting in double and effort usually wins out. Totally. What did making the college team mean to you? Oh my God. It, it meant, I mean, out of all, like I've done a lot in business, but that meant more to me. And the reason it meant more is because it was harder for me to make the college team than have a, a significant role in the high school team. And I didn't have a significant role in the high school team because I had the wrong attitude. Mm. And it, it meant to me, like, you can achieve anything that you want as long as you are laser focused. And I was willing to do anything to get on that team. I was willing to play any position. I was willing to do any sort of training. I was willing to show up early, stay late, ask questions, like study the playbook, like anything. And, and I realized like in, in, in life, like even if you aren't as talented as somebody else, as, as long as you're willing to like go all in, that a lot of times kind of wins. So, you know, I, I look back and say, out of everything, I'm 40, I turned 40 in July, out of everything I've ever done, that was my most like overachievement moment. Um, so I'm, I'm extremely proud of it, even though it, it was just as simple as making a division three football team, but it was an overachievement. And it's such an interesting thing too, because like I think about real estate, it's a mental game yep. and it's, so it's a mental in the sense of knowledge and it's a mental in the sense of grinding it out. So it's like, there's, I think it's easier to believe that you could do whatever you want in a mental game, but in a physical game, there's a like football, like it's physical and mental. Yeah. So what sort of things like, give us a little bit more than nitty gritty. Like what did you have to do? Did you have to become faster? stronger, mm -hmm. smarter, like what were the types of things and, and how'd you make that work? Yeah, there were, there were multiple things. Uh, I did have to become stronger. So I spent, you know, the whole year kind of in the weight room, I had to become faster. So I did a, a lot of, you know, training. We, we had these things, you, you I, most people don't know what they are. They're called strength shoes. And, um, do you know what they are? Yeah. Like, yeah. So I played football for one year and then sports my whole life. Yeah. yeah, there are these weird shoes that you you basically stay on your calves the whole time. I did the the whole summer in in strength shoes, but that was the that was the physical component of getting bigger, faster, stronger. But the mental component was just as important. And the mental component for me were simple things like always be the first person at practice, right? Because coaches see that. Always be the last person there. Always make sure that if like 
you don't know something about the playbook, go and talk to your coaches after the fact. Show them that you are trying to make the best effort. Um, another thing, just another mental thing is like, you know, people say go 100% and that's kind of probably an overused concept, but try to go 100% as much as you can versus like giving up on a play or saying like, this won't matter. And again, like it's the hustle component of life that ends up mattering. And, you know, Michael Jordan, there's this, there's this famous thing and, and it's just so true. And um, I'm going to paraphrase it, but I'm probably going to screw it up a little bit. But uh, Michael Jordan, he was in like his eighth or ninth year and he was on top of the world. He had just won multiple championships, multiple MVPs. Everybody said he was, you know, if not the greatest player ever, one of the greatest players ever. And um, there was a sports reporter who was covering one of his games and they saw him. Um, uh, the, the Bulls were up like 15 points in the fourth quarter and there were only like six minutes left. And the ball was about to go out of bounds and Jordan dove to, 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 to keep it in. And he kept it in. And after the game, the sports reporter said to him, he said, you're Michael Jordan. The game was basically over, right? You were up 15 with six minutes left. Like you guys knew you were going to win. Like, and you're Michael Jordan. Like, why are you going to risk an injury? Why are you diving for the ball? He was seriously like asking. He didn't understand. And he said, what you don't understand is that 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 is Michael Jordan, meaning meaning that like that's what made Michael Jordan. It's it's not that I'm Michael Jordan and I can not have to dive out of bounds. It's that I am diving out of bounds on every play and I treat every play like that. There's no off switch to say, oh, well, we're up 10. Let me like back off. It's full throttle all the way down. And, you know, getting to the mindset thing, like if Michael Jordan didn't succeed in basketball, he would have succeeded in something else because it's the mindset component. Yeah, 100%. So what I'd love to do, like you have a lot of success in real estate. And as that translates, oftentimes we become coaches and teachers as you have done. Yep. What student are you most passionate about? Not particularly a specific student, but, but there's a, an avatar or there's mm. a type of person that I think we fall in love with as a teacher. Yeah. Like, who are you truly passionate about? Yeah. And this is, this is such a bad thing, but I think it's just true of everybody, which is that like, I'm most passionate about helping people that were in the same position as me. And, and I think that's just kind of like a truism. And, um, I do do my best with every single person that I work with, but what, what resonates with me is seeing somebody that is young and hungry and has nothing, like came from nothing, doesn't have anything, has no skills, but they have the work ethic. And um, Rick Pitino, actually, I, I read one of his books and he said that um, he interviewed, Rick Pitino interviewed a, a business owner and the business owner said, I look for PhDs. And Rick Pitino said, oh, that's awesome. You look for people with advanced degrees. And the, the guy said to him, no, I look for PhDs, poor, hungry, and driven. And, <laughs> I love um, it. <laughs> and love and it. that resonates with me because that was me. So <clears throat> what's challenging for me is when, you know, I'm helping somebody and they just keep pushing back as to why they can't do this or they can't do that. And they're not willing to kind of do what it takes. And what resonates with me is somebody who's just like, they're all in on whatever you tell them to do. You could tell them to run through a wall and they're going to do it. And so for me, like that's the type of person I like working with the most for, because I see my younger self in them. And like I said, I mean, this is just like the reality of it. Like I do try to help everybody the same, but that's the type of student. Cause I know what the result is going to be when, when they're a PhD. Yeah. So Take us into some PhD examples, right? And like, because a lot of people present themselves as such. Oh, yes. yeah, I'm so oh. hungry. I'm so driven. I'm yep. going to do it. All right, get up with me at four o'clock tomorrow morning. Eh, over. Yep. So mm -hmm. what is your PhD vetting process, right? I mean, to become a PhD in the doctorate sense in the real world, I mean, there's a dissertation. There's hard work that proves that you're at that status. What is the Tom definition or vetting process for a PhD? So I don't have a process because I do believe in giving everybody opportunity. And so I'm not going to say, oh, I think you're a PhD. You're not a PhD. And one of the reasons I do that, besides the fact that I want to give everybody an opportunity, is because I've been wrong. I've been wrong. And so, you know, somebody can be a really good salesperson, 
and sell you on their potential and sell you on what they're going to do. And another person could be a terrible salesperson and they're the ones that the, actually the PhD. So I, I don't have a vetting process, but like you alluded to, like th that becomes very evident very early on, right? Like the first time that you're supposed to do anything, do you show up? I mean, even in Matt, my coaching program, again, I probably shouldn't even be saying this, but um, I have a monthly coaching call, right? With, with all the students. And, you know, I have probably 40 people in the program right now. Do you know how many people show up to that to that monthly call? <laughs> take, take a guess. I, I will because the the statistics, and I've looked at these statistics. It's generally between like four and eight percent, and some are even lower. Yeah. So I would say out of like the forty to fifty people every month, I get probably ten people that show up. Oh, so you're sitting around like eight to, or like twenty to twenty five percent. Well, when you're saying that, we're just talking about showing up to like you know a call. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that, that, that all of those people are even taking action. Um, so it's, it's one of the, from a, a coaching and education perspective, it's one of the most frustrating things that you can deal with and getting back to like the PhDs and how like they matter to me is that when I see that person and they're exhibiting those things, that's what gets me excited knowing that somebody's going to have that success. So it's a, it's a, it's a really weird world, I think, because um, you know, somebody said that 90% of success is just showing up. And I thought that that was like, not true. I was like, how could that ever be true? But you just see it over and over again, that most people don't show up. Most people say they're going to show up, but as soon as coming to a, you know, a coaching, you know, session interferes with them, like doing their yoga class, like they're out. And, um, <laughs> by the way, I'm not knocking that. Like, I just think this is my belief. I think either you commit or you don't. Either you say, I want to, you know, be a freedom chaser and I want to achieve financial freedom and I'm going to do the things necessary. Or you say, that sounds really cool, but I know I'm not going to do it. It's not for me. And when somebody says, if so, almost nobody says this, but if somebody said that to me, I'd shake their hand and I would say, you're happy. You're doing what you want. You're not interested in this. Cool. Like, I'm not the one to tell you what to do. But what I hate is when somebody tells me like they're going to do all these things and then they don't even show up to like step number one. Have you ever had somebody come in, present themselves as a PhD, not be a PhD, but then become a PhD? Ooh. Or was it Ooh, always success man. from the get go? Yeah. I have to really, really think about that. And, and my gut instinct is to say no. Um, because I do think it's like, it's a personality mindset trait that, um, it's not that it can't be reversed, but you know, it's a weird thing. Our personalities are formed at a very early age. And it's one of these things, like, even by the time you get to like your twenties, it's tough. Like I talked about the football story with me that changed me. Because I, I learned the hard way, like, you're not as good as you think you are. You have to work double. And that happened to me at like 16 or 17. So I think it can happen. I think it can happen. I just think it's rare because when that happened to me, I had to become a new person. I truly had to become a new person that wasn't entitled, didn't think the world, you know, owed them anything. And, and even as good as I thought I was, you know, I'm not as good as I think I am. And I had to humble myself, which is like, it's like an ego thing. Like, you know, I used to think, well, you know, if I show up five minutes late, well, I'm better. So it's okay. Right. And it's a humbling thing to be like, not only can you not do that, but you have to be there early. You have to stay late. You have to do every intangible thing. So it's really like, it's, it's, it's looking at yourself and being honest. And being like, okay, because we put up these barriers around ourselves to kind of like protect ourselves emotionally to say like, you know, I'm better than I really am. And, you know, to make yourself kind of like feel good. And it's taking down that barrier and going, wow, like I have a lot of room to grow. I need to be open to coaching. I need to be open to listening. Um, you know, and again, not to get too much off on, you know, coaching, but like, you know, there's times when I have coaching conversations and the other person's like doing all the talking. 
And I always think, I always look at that too, getting back to the PhD, which is like, I'm in multiple coaching programs. I'm in three right now. And if I'm in a coaching program, I'm getting coached. I'm asking questions and I'm listening. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it doesn't mean like, it doesn't mean that if you have a coach, you have to do everything that they tell you to do. But your objective, you know, for anybody that's thinking about joining a coaching program is you want the information in that other person's brain. The only way to do that is to listen, not to talk. Yeah. And this, this goes down to the root of it, right? I mean, if you've done your due diligence on who's coaching you and you're narrow in the focus, you're like, I'm hiring this coach for this specific skill or this specific action or mindset. Like the due diligence process is to make sure that they are where you want to be in life. And if they yep. are like, like go in hundred percent, like mm. I've hired coaches that have taken me to the next level. I've hired coaches that gave me wrong advice, but I still took yep. the hook line and sinker. And then I had to figure out that was the wrong coach. Um, and that's a challenge in and of itself to even pick the right coach. Like it's not as simple as just saying like, you need a coach. No, you don't need a coach. You need the right coach. And to me, there's two components of that. The first component is you have to be where that person is now, not maybe what that person read on YouTube or what they read in a book or something like they need to literally be doing the things or have already done the things that you want to do. And then the second thing is just, you need a personality match. And, you know, for me, like, I'm very honest, like to a fault, like, I'm not going to tell you, you did a good job. If you did a bad job, I'm going to tell you, if you did a good job, if you did a good job, like I am, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. Cause I just don't believe in it. So like my personality works with a certain type of person and I, I can guarantee that I would make some other people cry. Um, <laughs> right. Not that I mean, just that I'm not going to lie to you. Um, so that's the other component too. Like if you need somebody, you know, with a softer touch or maybe, you know, it could be male, female, it could be age, it could be whatever, like fine. I, and I would just say like for everybody, like I'm in three coaching programs now, find a coach or a mentor or somebody that you can get around. That's where you want to be. That has a personality match. You're like, Oh, I, I wouldn't mind, you know, hanging out with that person at some point. Yeah. Love it. So you're being coached all the time. You're providing mm -hmm. coaching. You, you kind of embody the philosophy that we love, which is one hand up, one hand down, right? Always mm -hmm. be leveling up because if, if you're always helping people, then you're likely going to be not growing and you're, you're oftentimes you're sinking. So tell us like, now that you've achieved this level of freedom, like what, what does the next portion of your life, like if you had a billion dollars in the bank and a hundred lifetimes of cash flow, like what would your life look like? Well, if I had all the money in the world, um, geez, all the money in the world and had no need for money, what I would do is something that I'm not doing right now, which is I would be involved in the educational process, you know, in not maybe elementary school, but maybe like high school. Um, or colleges. Um, and the, the thing that I don't love about the whole system right now is that I don't love the everybody should go to college mantra. Um, and I don't even love, you know, how they teach in general. And I'm somebody who did very well in the way that they teach now. But I, I, I believe that there are so many kids out there that are getting left behind because their skill set is not what school is kind of showing, right? Like somebody able to read and memorize something like, yeah, there's value in that. But at the same time, the most frustrating thing to, to me is to see a kid with a bunch of energy who they're like labeling with all these problems and saying like, they're, they're, they're not a good student. When in reality, like let's flash back, you know, thousands of years, like what was more valuable? Somebody who could hunt and do all these things or is it, you know, that had energy that was up, you know, whatever, or is it somebody that could sit at a desk for like 10 hours a day? That person back then was probably, they labeled, probably labeled that person as they have a problem. So what I don't like about the system is it's like a one size fits all and it, it leaves out people. It doesn't teach about money. It doesn't teach about potentially being an entrepreneur. Um, and, and I just think that like, it's serving a certain percentage of the population, but not all of it. And I think it could just be so much better. And again, you know, being one person, could I have a big impact on that? I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure that even if it was just like out of school clubs or things like that, like I would love to teach kids about money and teach kids about owning a business just so that they even understand it. Because even, 
even as an employee, one of the, the issues that employers and employees have is employees usually don't understand the employer perspective. And it's always like this like battle between employer and an, an employee when it, in, in an ideal world, maybe this is too idealistic, but like, you know, an employee should understand that an employer has a profit motive and they should be thinking in their head, hey, how can I be in line with the employer? And that would increase production all across the board and create, you know, better relationships between them. It, to me, it's not about like, this is my boss. He's a bad guy. It, it should be as much of a partnership as it could be, right? Yeah. And what's interesting too, like you talk about the failing of the system. As the rise of AI continues, things are changing. And so it was yeah. like before Google, memorization had some value because if you yeah. didn't know it, you didn't know it. There was It was hard to look up. Then Google comes along and now memorization, the value of it decreases significantly in the marketplace. We're coming to a place where general knowledge and searchable knowledge through AI is going to replace a lot of functions. Mm. And so it's like, I feel like the puck is moving towards yes. creativity, ingenuity. Like those are the valuable skills of the future. And that is not present in the school system. So I, I'm with you. Like if we were to reinvent the school system, like we'd have to completely look at it differently because even knowledge itself is becoming of different utility than it will be, than it was say 30 years ago, 50 years ago. Yeah. It's just, it's just crazy. I mean, some stuff does need to be memorized. I mean, doing math and, you know, stuff like that. Like you want to learn those base things, but yeah, it's, it's changing. And, and, you know, like, as, as I'm saying this, like solving this problem is not easy, right? Like this is not something where like, I know all, I know how to teach kids. I know how to run a school system. I don't, I'm, I'm only merely identifying what the problems are. And I, and I don't think that the problems are even being considered. And all I would want is like that they get considered and maybe to make some changes towards just making it better for everybody, for the teachers, for the kids, for society in general. And I think that like we're using a way of teaching that worked literally a hundred years ago. So there has to be, well, not has to be, it would be best if there was some sort of like change to that. I agree. Like one of the things I think about often because I was a high school teacher is like, the, giving a lot of money to organizations to create lots of pilot programs in this regard yes. Yes. And, and letting students choose and giving some window of opportunity and let all of the entrepreneurial minds and all the thought minds go out there. And maybe there's some parameters where there has to be some connection, you know, to some of the structures of the school system. But, but I think if, if we don't experiment fast enough, it's just, it's, we're going to get farther and farther behind where we could be particularly because our world's not a static world. Um, mm. Let's talk about what you're up to the next 12 to 18 months. What are you really driving at? So I, I really have kind of like two things that I'm, you know, doing at, the, at the, really the same time. The first is really helping all agents invest in real estate. There's over 2 million agents across the United States. I firmly believe it's crazy that all 2 million don't invest. And I know most of them don't invest because they don't know how to, or they haven't been exposed to it. So the agent investor brand, whether it's the Facebook group, the podcast, or the two day events seeks to help change that as much as I can. And we provide, you know, free training, free resources to agents who want to invest in real estate, or even who just want to help their clients invest in real estate. And the, the easiest way there's, there's really two ways that people can get access to that. The first is, to join the Facebook group. There's over 10,000 members in the Facebook group and people can get access by going to www.agentinvestor.com. And again, there's so much free information in there. I do a live stream every Tuesday at 11 o'clock and then podcasting. And I know obviously we're recording a podcast right now. Podcasting is such a no brainer. It is such a no brainer because you, you can tell me, hey, I don't have time to be on Facebook. You can tell me I can't come to a two day event but don't tell me you can't have time to podcast because if you're an agent, no matter who you are, you have time in your car, you have time when you're exercising, you have time when you're doing your laundry and you have at least one hour a day where you could podcast and people can listen to my podcast at www.agentinvestorpodcast.com. Now, you might be hearing me right now and you may not have any interest in my podcast, 
that's okay, right? Good, going back to Max's point, find somebody whose message resonates with you and start downloading their podcast. That person's brain, like there, we live, I mean, such so many great things about today's world, but in 2023, information is freer than ever. And but by a podcast, it's so accessible. I mean, you're clicking a button and you're anywhere in the world getting that person's brain telling you like what their strategies are. And people don't really hold back. I mean, it's one of these things where like, you might think like somebody's really successful. They're not going to tell you their secrets. I mean, every podcast I ever listen to, I get some nugget from it. And there's so many smart and hardworking and successful people giving away their information. And so that's number one. And number two for me is growing up my apartment portfolio. You know, you mentioned syndications and we raise capital for our syndications. And um, I do a lot of raising capital for our syndications. The reason I do apartments is because they're passive. Talking about, you know, freedom chasing. Um, I used to own a lot of small multifamily real estate. Small multifamily real estate is great. It it is it is definitely a much more freedom based thing than being an agent. Being an agent is a more freedom based thing than being an employee. But apartments are even more freedom because we build fifty to one hundred and fifty unit apartment buildings, brand new, where there's no deferred maintenance in nice towns. We get high quality tenants, and it's truly. At, you know, getting along the lines of being like passive again, it's nearly fully passive. If you want to be fully passive, then you invest in one of these deals and you do no work. I'm kind of almost there. But I think like, again, getting back to just real estate in general, like the whole thing is you're making improvements towards full freedom. And, you know, obviously the ultimate goal, like you kind of mentioned is, hey, you're, you know, you're a billionaire, you have all the money in the world, then what are you doing? And that question really made me think because I'm like, oh, I feel like I've got full freedom, but I don't yet. Because if I did, then that's actually what I would be doing. I'd be trying to figure out something with the school systems. I look so forward to when you're doing that. Like we are so aligned on that. I actually bought the do domain notocollege.com for that <laughs> specific purpose. So I uh, would love to collaborate with you on that. And for those of you listening, like think about some of the stuff that we talked about today. Maybe it's the $115,000 that you could be losing by not really being okay with the problems and solving them. Maybe it's the fact that you're a better salesman to others than you are to your own self on selling yourself on the right actions. Whatever it was that you got from this episode, write it down, share it with somebody you know so that they can hold you accountable because freedom is acquired one action at a time. And as you take these steps, you move towards freedom. And before you know it, you're going to be living a life of freedom and purpose. So thank you guys for tuning in and we'll catch you on the next episode.